I am pleased to welcome everyone here this evening, especially Dan Hawthorne's family. And his many friends to this sacred space of St. Mary's College, which reminds us that we are in the holy presence of God. Like a saint's vision, like the veil of things, as they seem drawn back by an unseen hand, we perceive, Lord, your blessings that we enjoy from an insightful mind and the vivacious, vivacious spirit of a man we knew and loved as Brother Dan, Father Dan, Professor Dan, Drama Director Dan, Theologian Dan, Husband Dan, My Dad Dan, My Confidant, My Inspiration. He was a perceptive actor, a thoughtful, imaginative, an independent artistic soul who deeply loved the drama of Christ's life. And that drama spelled out in theology, philosophy, his family, and on the stage of life well performed. A few weeks ago, Lord, you guided me to Dan's bedside, to this talented doctor of theology who had offered to become intimately involved in dramatics and the development of the Department of Performing Arts. My confidence strengthened that Christian principle would be part of the veil of things drawn back by perceptive hands on the St. Mary's stage. That same afternoon, Dan spoke with anticipation as he looked forward to the awesome experience that would soon fully energize his soul. He offered whatever anxiety he had within as well as the fruit of his life labors to you, Lord, for Penny, his family, his students, colleagues, and the good of the college he cared about as well. I knew I was speaking to a man of faith and passion who was enveloped in the very mystery of soon embracing the God he loved. He was overflowing with the prayerful excitement of a grace-filled man whose life expressed what it meant to pursue authentic happiness and the good of others. I drove home that afternoon, saying to myself that I was blessedly honored to have spent a few valuable moments with a saintly soul who yearned to greet the forthcoming reality and glory of a holy presence of God.
he loved mentoring students. And he loved mentoring some of us. <laughs> he believed deeply in the project of Catholic higher education. And he loved this place passionately. One of my earliest memories of Dan is that of attending one of the events surrounding Brother Mel's new century committee back in the mid-90s and the production of what was then our new mission statement for which Dan crafted the final language. I recall Dan's evident passion for the liberal arts and specifically for the unique contribution that the Catholic intellectual tradition made to the liberal as many of you know, Dan was a laicized priest, and leaving the priesthood, leaving the active priesthood, was a difficult and painful act for him. He and Penny met and fell in love when they were both doctoral students at Union Theological Seminary in New York. I recall the table conversation here at St. Mary's in my early days when Dan talked about how much he missed being able to serve as an actor, as a priest. I also recall, though, how very much Penny and Dan were in love. I remember going with them one time to San Francisco with uh, Dan's sister-in-law, Judy. We went to hear uh, Ken Burns, the filmmaker, Ken Burns, talk about his latest production at the Commonwealth Club. And there was a reception. And I recall seeing Penny and Dan holding hands like teenage sweethearts in the distance of the room. It was very touching. Dan was a priest and a husband and a father. The personal qualities that made him a good priest were the very same qualities that made him a good husband and a good father. Throughout our relationship, I always thought of Dan as a priest even though he was no longer in active ministry. He was a very important mentor and role model for me, very important. As noted earlier, Dan played a pivotal role in the creation of the college's beautiful mission statement. It was a labor of love to which he devoted many, many hours. Even today, all these years later, that mission statement continues to be a source of inspiration for many of us. I recall including it with pride in some of the promotional materials that we designed for the former graduate liberal studies program at Penny Factor. Dan was deeply concerned about the prospects for the future of the Catholic intellectual tradition at St. Mary's. It was a concern that he and I shared, and about which we exchanged many books and articles, and about which we spent many hours in conversation. In 2003, Dan and I decided to recruit a number of faculty colleagues, including Brother Mel, to work on the design and launch of a Catholic Studies program for St. Mary's. It was our fond hope and dream that such a program could help to secure the future of the Catholic tradition, not only in campus ministry or social justice activities, but in the very intellectual life of the college. We worked long and hard on that for several years, and we finally brought it to the Undergraduate Policies Committee in the fall of 2005. I happened to be on sabbatical that fall at the University of Notre Dame, and I still remember Dan calling me on the phone, and the, the hurt and disappointment that I heard in Dan's voice when he told me that the program had not gained the approval of the faculty. Dan struggled as many of us do, with certain aspects of the institutional church. He lamented the backwardness of some church leaders and their seeming inability to inspire us by bringing our rich Catholic tradition to bear on the cultural questions of the day. Dan, however, never gave up on the church. He understood that for all of her flaws, it was the earthen vessel, as St. Paul describes it, that carries within it the fragile treasure of our faith. Faith, and Dan's own deep journey for personal authenticity, were the very hallmarks of his life.
His faith journey sometimes brought him pain, but it also brought him in touch with a reservoir of deep, deep joy. His faith animated and made sense out of his whole life. His faith carried him throughout life and through the final days of his illness with lung cancer. I had the immense privilege of spending time with him and with Penny during those final weeks, and we were able on several occasions to celebrate the Eucharist together at their home in Alameda. It was so clear to me as Brother Mel remarked, that Dan was on a profound mystical journey. It was something very deep that was going on in him. And he sometimes would become demonstrably moved during our times of prayer and faith sharing. Knowing Penny and Dan has truly been one of the greatest gifts of my life. We love you, Dan. We will always remember you and the gift that you give to all of us. Hello. I came to St. Mary's in 1984 to teach music, and Dan was my primary mentor. I had attended large state universities, and my background was Jewish, and he really helped my transition into this wonderful but very different environment at St. Mary's. Dan coached me not only to be a good professor in the performing arts, but to comprehend and be supportive of the core Catholicity of the college. He explained the LaSallian concept that teaching is an exalted profession because the more knowledge one possesses, the closer one is to God. That each soul who attends St. Mary's is important and more than important, beautiful, and therefore deserving of our very best attention and effort. So these were the lofty values Dan imparted to me. His coaching was always down to earth. For example, as I was preparing to become an academic advisor, he gave me the most simple, practical, and best advice. No workshops or training sessions were required. He said, learn the mechanics of which classes satisfy what requirements, and review each student's file 15 minutes prior to his or her advising <laughs> This sounds obvious, but it happened in uh, my experience at the schools I have attended. Following Dan's directions ensured that each student received the quality advice that he or she was entitled to. It was not only the college's institutional value, but what Dan believed in personally, and I did my best to convey them over the course of my career. Thanks, Dan. As we know, Dan was an actor and director and theater professor who taught here for 28 years. And by the time he retired in 2008, he had enriched this college immeasurably. In its earliest days, what is now the Performing Arts Department was not a department at all. It was a service program that staged theatrical productions. There were no majors, no musical ensembles, no dance company, and the curriculum consisted solely of art appreciation courses. There was a handful of part-time faculty members and a grand total of one full-time professor, Dan Conner. <laughs> It was his vision and energy that moved the performing arts to a whole department, and what an arduous journey that was. For example, one of many on this side. During those early years, on multiple, occasions, on multiple occasions, Dan valiantly and without success tried to inaugurate a college choir, but there were always, always pitches and hurdles. It really graded him that the college would lack something so basic as a choir. Then, in 1990, he directed the musical Joseph and the Amazing Technical Adventure, and a lot of singers and words for auditions. After the show closed, cast members asked him how they might continue singing, singing together, and at last, with Brother Mel's help, he was able to begin a choir and an ensemble that has since become a I must add that as performing art department chair, 
Yeah, also played an integral role in launching the St. Mary's Chamber Musicians, Jazz Band, and Dancing. The department now boasts numerous majors, 11 full-time faculty members, a master's program, award-winning ensembles in theater, dance, and music, and numerous alumni who have gone on to earn graduate degrees and are now working in the field. The momentum for all this is starting to Dan was an exceptional teacher with students both in the classroom and on the stage. Actors were stretched beyond previous limits, and he was a personal director who possessed the artistry and craft to bring out the architecture and poignancy of a dramatic work. The 23 plays he directed included repertoire from Greek tragedy, classical comedy, Broadway, contemporary realism, contemporary anti-realism, among them Antigone, Men of the Mancha, Our Town, Despite the obstacles of making theater at a small college, the results were consistently outstanding. He published articles in numerous journals about a modern interpretation of spirituality in the works of the playwright Eugene O'Neill. As an actor, he had performed with San Jose Repertory, California Shakespeare Festival, Center Repertory Theater, and many other Bay Area companies. Most significant professionally and most meaningful to Dan personally, were his recurring performances of a powerful one-person play written by Aldith Morris. We'll see an excerpt later on this evening. It was entitled Damien. It was about a maverick priest who ministered at the leper colony of Molokai. Dan presented his very demanding work at St. Mary's, numerous venues throughout California, and Scotland's prestigious Edinburgh Festival Fringe, programmed it for a two-week run, where it garnered great reviews. Damien was a role that resonated deeply inside of Dan. As a former priest, he nurtured a rich and lively Catholic spirituality throughout his 80 years, and Damien represented the intersection of Dan's life in the theater and his life in the Catholic. For 21 years, Dan served as director of the St. Mary's Committee for Lectures, Art, and Music, where he was responsible for bringing, for bringing guest artists and lecturers to his duties were to irrigate the arts and intellectual landscape in a, in a climate that was sometimes here. Notable lecturers who he brought here include former CIA director and secretary of defense, Leon Panetta, Oscar Arias, who was former president of Costa Rica, sister Helen Prejean, who wrote Dead Man Walking, and many others. Dan was assisted by two wonderful staff members, Sharon Cahill and Sally Hogarty. And the three of them shared, I hear, a lot of self-deprecating humor and laughter. I did hear the laughter. When I was a junior professor, Dan observed my teaching and read my evaluations, and he was very supportive and affirming. Years later, I became his chair, and I then had the opportunity to observe him and read his evaluations. Of course, by that time, I already knew he was a great teacher, but I didn't know just how great until I read the extent to which his students raved about him. For his pedagogical creativity, his artistry, scholarship, service, and dedication, Dan was named 1995 St. Mary's Professor of the Year. For his excellence as a teacher, he received the 2003 St. John Baptist de La Salle Teaching Award, and when he retired in 2008, he was honored with the title of Professor of the Dan was more than my colleague and mentor. He was also my friend. He, Sharon Cahill, and I enjoyed talking about our families. We all had one son and one daughter, and we occasionally shared the challenges of parenting them. He surely loved his Stephanie and Nick, and since they were older than my son and daughter, as were Sharon's kids, they sometimes had helpful insights from them. Um, I should say Stephanie and Nick, he never said anything that was that he would be embarrassed by. So <laughs> About a year ago, the three of us met for lunch, and as we were updating one another, he did say that his lung would be overtaken out of his But again, we talked about our kids, and then also our grandkids. In June, our colleague Lino Rivera and I visited him. It was the last time we were together. Mostly we talked about his plans for this memorial. <coughs> he appeared
here completely relaxed, discussing the inevitability of his death. And I said, Dave, decades ago, you told me that you'd be at peace when you faced the ending of your life. Now that the time is here, do you still feel that way? And without pausing, he answered, Yeah, I'm really fine. And then he asked me how my kids were doing. A couple weeks later, on July 4th, Dan emailed me. And before I tell you the nature of that email, I should mention that he was a very good singer, and I was jealous that he had perfect pitch and I did not. <laughs> For years, he sang on the choir we're about to hear the Tari from Rebo. And I'll close by sharing that brief email exchange. Dan wrote, David Morales has agreed to take responsibility for all of the music on the service. And Dan then listed the music which is in tonight's program. And he said, it's going to be grand. I had to. I'm sure it will. <laughs> and I do hope you'll be there. And he replied, you can count on
name is Andy from Gay Brown. I first met Dan 20 years ago in the fall of 1998 when Dan co-taught a proceeding performing arts class with Marty and Professor Davalos. And from there, Dan asked me to perform and play right there, literally right there, thereabouts. Called Boy with a Cart. It's a great play. It's a terrible title, but it's a great play. And that was the start of a long and wonderful friendship at many important times in my life. And was very much a sort of spiritual father figure. Dan had asked me to speak about his legacy as a teacher, and um, that's just not possible. <laughs> there is no way to sum all of that up here. It's, it's too immense. But I am privileged to offer what tribute I can. And I know we're in the presence of a lot of great students, and scholars, and theater, and performing arts, so it makes me a little nervous to speak of philosophy, but I'll offer this. I think the average lay person thinks of theater as artifice, as creating worlds which are often magical, but fundamentally not real. And in my experience, that wasn't at all what Dan was up to. In dance theater, the whole production was always chasing the powerful hope for moments when, in a fleeting but a very real way, a group of strangers could see and share their connections, fellow humans. You could suffer someone else's injustice, you could soothe another's pain, you could exalt in another's joy. For Dan, those moments weren't artifice. They were revelation. They were a, a sacramental glimpse of the way the world really is. Those moments were a chance to experience the truth that we are all brothers and sisters lives and our souls are inextricably bound up. We are, all of us, family. All the little stories and the big stories that we make up in our daily living to tell ourselves that there are others, enemies, them, that's the artifice. And in the theater with Dan, you could experience the In the last conversation we had, Dan talked about that old Corinthians passage, now we see as in a mirror darkly, dimly, depending on how you translate it. I think in the theater dancing, it was just to polish up that mirror ever so slightly, so that if only for a fleeting moment, one could see a true image the way we really are. Dan didn't impart knowledge or teach a craft, and he did, he very much did, but that wasn't what he was doing. When you really had the experience that Dan invited you into, it shaped you. Once you've experienced that connection between you and your fellow humans, no matter how unlike or distant or strange or even important they might seem, once you experience it, that connection can't be forgotten. In my life now, I see and experience all kinds of things I couldn't even have imagined when I was a student here. I'm, I'm a lawyer. I've done capital case mitigation work. Now I work with juvenile delinquents in a pretty rough part of our country. I'm a foster parent. That I see things, I see really awful things that I can't even describe, 
And in most days, honestly, I'm just struggling and usually failing to do one decent thing by my brothers and sisters. And I couldn't possibly have appreciated this all those years ago. But I know now, on those, on those rare and awesome occasions, when I actually managed to do or say the right thing, just thing, merciful thing, when I make a connection with someone, or better yet, help someone else connect with another person's humanity, I know now where it was that I first started to understand how that can happen. I know I really learned how to do that when I thought I was just acting in a play or getting a cup of coffee with Dan. I'd submit that Dan's greatest legacy as an educator is the way that countless students really came to know through having experienced it. Their connection to their brothers and sisters came to be just a little more empathetic and compassionate, and then carry that out into the world. There's no way to comprehend the good that flowed out into so many unexpected corners of the world from the end of the life you led here. Penny, Nick, Stephanie, my wife's a professor. You know, it's not always an easy thing to share in your loved one's life with the life of a university and the endless array of students and projects. And God preserves all many meetings. <laughs> but I hope you know that what Dan did here, God, it was such a grace. It was such a grace. And I pray that hearing about it is a small measure of comfort in your time of grief and will be a source of great joy in the many wonderful years to come. And Dan, my friend, my mentor, my spiritual father, my brother, until we meet again, rest in peace.
Good evening. I'm Dan's friend, Darren. Dan and I met over a dozen years ago when he recruited me to join the board of directors of the Eugene O'Neill Foundation. I had been aware of Dan's work as a director and an actor before being introduced to him by our friend Michael Cook. Years before we met, I remember laughing nonstop at his production of My Sister Eileen at the Willows Theater. I should start by saying that I'm pretty unsure where to start. That anything I could say to summarize Dan would instantly sound like hyperbole. That it would be impossible to capture the breadth and scope of this human being in anything resembling a short speech. Thankfully, I think he would agree. And he himself was rarely the deliverer anything resembling a short speech. <laughs> All I can do is tell you in brief what our friend Dan, what our friend is to me. Dan is my mentor, my role model, and one of my inspirations. That will never fail. The mentor piece is easy to imagine and understand. Who would not want Dan as their mentor? He instantly treated me like I was special, like a member of his family. I think we all are his family. If you came into his house or his theater or his classroom, you became a part of this family, fully and devotedly, no questions asked. His love and knowledge of theater is awesome and vast. He makes you want to experience every piece ever written. It is rare to find an O'Neill historian that also has a great love for musical theater. Dan was recently in my concert production of South Pacific. He would tell me how just sitting in the wings, listening to the accomplished singers, was an inspiration to him. Dan and Penny have seen a lot of my work as a director and producer in the Bay Area. I would always ask them for feedback. Dan would often start soft until I would say, be real with me, and then the juicy feedback would begin. I value their honest reviews. Dan and Penny have made me a better storyteller. I will miss experiencing theater with Dan. Sadly for you, Penny, you are stuck with me. My role model gives the best advice. I will never forget how Dan handled my adventure into fatherhood. I will save you from the details, but I will say, Dan was there for me every step of the way, building me up, telling me stories about his successes and failures as a father. He loves talking about Stephanie, Nick, Peggy, and his grand boys, Franklin. I remember watching him interact with all of them and my son at his recent birthday party. I strive to be like Dan with my boy Jack. I strive to be like Dan with artists in a rehearsal studio. I strive to be like Dan when I'm speaking in front of a large audience. The inspiration and the guidance are not over because I cannot make eye contact with Dan or listen to his voice. Dan will always be with all of us. He is a tower of kindness, intellect, and will whose passion for learning was ceaseless and unquenchable. He knew how to handle the world with grace, charm, assertiveness, savvy, and I have never known and will never know again a man so generous, so willing to give his time, his resources, his forgiveness, his heart, and everything at his disposal to help anyone who needed it. What did he give me? He gave me his love and his friendship and himself. I'm willing to bet he gave all of us his love, his companionship, and himself. Love you, buddy. A sparkle to all things theatrical. One of Dan's favorite moments, aside from the quintessential fail speech from Long Day's Journey and Tonight, is the end of Act Three in Moon for the Misbegotten. Josie cradling Jamie and A, as Dan described, 
in a Pieta moment. As Dan said, Josie mothered Jamie into death, a poignant reminder for all of us. And another favorite was the last scene in Beyond the Horizon, the longing for transcendence. Dan was first exposed to O'Neill and Valdez from Harvard in high school and continued his love for theater into graduate school, where he wrote his dissertation that developed a theory of dramatic criticism from the thought of theologian Paul Tillich, and which, and which Dan applied to the moon of Mr. God. This fascination and appreciation of O'Neill's work never waned. Dan said, O'Neill is like bourbon. At first sip, you might never want it again. <laughs> but you just keep at it, and you'll eventually love it. <laughs> it's an acquired taste. And when he met Travis Bogart, it was a fate sealed in understanding the spiritual aspects of O'Neill's plays. After Travis departed, Dan continued to bring us actors and directors of great talent. Anthony Fusco, Joy Carlin, Ed Hastings, Barbara Oliver, Nancy Carlin, Laura Stratton, just to name a few. While teaching at St. Mary's, Dan created 101, which I had the good fortune of taking. I still have the paper that I wrote. <laughs> Via, uh, to O'Neill via Dan continued with board meetings, playwrights theater, which was his passion, and performing. Dan wrote with the genius of his soul, which I was in. But my connection with Dan began much earlier when I was part of the Shakespeare reading group for many years, where I met him and Penny. Dan devoted more than 20 years of service to the Eugene O'Neill Foundation. His first involvement was to help plan the Eugene O'Neill Centennial Celebration in 1988. He directed several fall plays at Dow House, including Faith Healer, which heralded the return of performances to Dow House following the Access Settlement, and served with distinction as Vice President of Program for 13 years. Inspiring the Foundation's creative direction, Dan was instrumental in the establishment of Playwrights Theater at Dow House. He became its artistic director following the death of Travis in 1997, and he also directed 13 Playwrights Theater productions, and was an active participant in the festivals. He was presented with the Artistic Award, Genie, in 2009 for his dedication and unique contributions to the Foundation. Though we missed the opportunity to work together in Long Day's journey into night with Lee Merriweather, I was finally blessed with directing him and a St. Mary's colleague on a short piece for the Eugene O'Neill Foundation Annual Dinner, a piece based on a contemporary meeting between James and Edmund at the grave of their mother Mary. He was, of course, wonderful to work with. What an honor for me to have had that opportunity. William Davies King, also a O'Neill scholar, is the one who said that Dan brought the sparkle to all things theatrical, not only to the theater and to the foundation, but to the world. The O'Neill book created in Danville was Dan's doing. He selected the artwork, worked with the sculptor, and wrote the text for the eight playbills created for the O'Neill commemorative walk across from the public library in Danville. He chose a selection of the veil speech for the centerpiece, with its phrase, like a saint's vision of beatitude, like a veil of things as they seem drawn back by an unseen hand. For a second you see, and seeing the secret are the secret. For a second there is meaning. Then the hand lets the veil fall, and you are alone, lost in the fog again and you stumble on toward nowhere for no good reason. Dan visited the places O'Neill lived. And you may not know this, but his rhythms of the soul, the musical fugue 
based on Travis Bogart's Eugene O'Neill songbook, almost made it to Broadway. Within one week of meeting with an enthusiastic producer, she called him and said that something else demanded her attention for the next several years. And she was sorry, but he could keep the airplane tickets in the hotel. So close. As it turns out, he too saw Jane Alexander perform in Morning Becomes Electra as Lavinia. We pondered that perhaps we had both seen the same performance. And we talked about Long Day's journey into night and how the ending is so very powerful. Should Mary wear the wedding dress? No, Dad said. Think of the ending. Mary is completely enveloped in her youth. Yes, I remember. I fell in love with James Tyrone and was so happy for a time. And Edmund O'Neill is not drunk, but sober, watching his mother descend into morphine madness. Dan, recognizing the exhilaration of the writing and the utter sorrow that O'Neill was finally able to expose, also experienced the hope that great theater leaves with the audience, even when surrounded by despair. O'Neill was finally able to write one of, if not his greatest play. Dan's appreciation of O'Neill was reflected in Dan's own personality and creativity, seeing beauty and poignancy in a time of darkness, and expressing it with his acting, directing, writing, and presence. It was his creative spirit and presence, his devotion and artistic contributions. That is the legacy we are so fortunate to have, and what we will all hold so dear.
As with everyone here tonight, my life has deepened by David. Being with him was like being inside a prism that refracts light in colors you never knew existed. Our lives intersected about 25 years ago through several areas of interest and circles of friends. Though the totality of our friendship felt so much greater than the sum of its parts. I was with Dan and Penny most regularly through a group of friends that met in a cafe for coffee after church every Sunday for the past few decades, which, when Dan was present, felt to me almost as much a sacrament as church itself. When Dan was not present, almost without exception, he and Penny were visiting family, most often in England and Oklahoma. I must admit that I sometimes felt as if Oklahoma were the other woman. <laughs> Taking Dan and Penny away from our cafe family. We knew that Dan loved Oklahoma, and Oklahoma loved him. On my better days, I too loved Oklahoma. <laughs> I knew how much of it was in Dan. Dan was weaned on southern and western virtues and values, the milk of his salt of the earth mother, Clara, and his father, Young. Dan loved his roots, nourished in Oklahoma soil, and knew that without them he would not have flourished so in that singular way he did in the California sun. We can't talk about Dan's roots without mentioning his birth. And we can't mention Dan's birth without talking about his identical twin, David. Daniel D. treasured being a twin to David Lee. Dan's closeness with David was one of the greatest joys in his life, and one that he believed a non-twin could never fully understand. And while the pain of losing David to lung cancer in 2001 was acute and raw, Dan found a redemptive quality to his own suffering from the loss, and believed that not even death could breach the soul connection they shared. The loss of David was eased by Dan's younger brother, Tom, whose relationship with Dan was strengthened and nurtured through years of letter writing between the two. Dan felt blessed by this connection such shock, sorrow, and Tom's sudden passing in 2011. David and Tom's son, Dan, left a big hole in the family. Both Tom and David had wives and children who keenly felt the loss of their passing. Though it was because of this loss, Dan cherished the role he took on as patriarch of this happy growing coffee plant. Every Christmas was spent in Oklahoma, many Easter's as well. Births, baptisms, weddings, holidays, hardships, and joys. Dan made himself available to his extended family, who returned his generosity of spirit with great love and devotion, made evident here only, not only by the journey they all took here to be here tonight, but also by the visits several made to see Dan in the last weeks of his life. Many of us were at Dan's immediate birthday party a short eight months ago, when he began his remarks by reflecting that his life was defined by two halves, before he met Penny and after. Meeting Penny Washmore. Meeting Penny Washmore was a defining moment in Dan's life. It happened in 1970 at the Union Theological Seminary in New York, where they were both pursuing doctorates in religious studies. Dan had left the priesthood several years earlier, having discerned that his calling was to family life. Imagine them, he from Oklahoma, she from England, two young, beautiful, intellectual dynamos, studying what they loved, preparing themselves for the their place in the world. Little did they know that in a few years that place would include Manitoba, Canada, where the newly married couple had both secured teaching positions, which they held for eight years. 
Later, Dan was keenly aware of the promising career Penny gave up to move with him to California to pursue his passion for theater. It was 1980 when they moved west to begin the California chapter of their lives. This American British couple with two Canadian babes in tow. Many of us watched as, as those two babes grew, moved through adolescence and young adulthood, emerging into the beautiful woman and man they are today. It's difficult for a child to fully understand the joy a parent experiences in reflecting on the art of their children's lives. Now that they are adults, Stephanie, a hugely popular and much beloved mentor to her students, and Nick, now a father with children of his own, no doubt understand the deep blessing and privilege Dad felt to be father to them. I recall Dad sharing one of his fondest parenting memories of a Saturday morning ritual which he and young men went to the Comics and Comics store in Berkeley. Nick would select a comic book, and the two would sit together in a cafe, father and son, Dan reading the New York Times, Nick is the only player in Hollywood. How Dan treasured this time. Another memory is of Dan's joy when Stephanie was admitted to Stanford, and the great pride he felt for each of her many storied academic achievements. As Stephanie and Nick found their respective places in the world, the family grew through marriage, and Dan was again blessed. Now in his role as father of Travel expanded as did the family, including Austin, Australia, New Zealand, Spain, a villa in Tuscany, a road trip to Oregon. It's testament to who they were as parents and people that Dan and Penny's children chose to share so many adventures with them. And then, of course, there's one of the greatest adventures of Dan's life, being grandfather to Franklin and Cooper. How Dan took to his role as grandma when he and Penny moved to Alameda to be close to them. We're all mindful of the poignancy and timing. Franklin born in 2011, just months after Dan's first cancer diagnosis and surgery, and Franklin then celebrating his seventh birthday, ten days before Dan died. Dan was alive not only to see both Franklin and Cooper born, but was given years with them, enabling him to know the preciousness of each of them and their individuality. Best of all, Dan got to play with them, swinging on swings, splashing in the pool, walking in the park, playing the piano, singing and sharing his love of music. Of course, Dad never experienced these parenting and grandparenting joys alone, for Penny was always by his side. Not only was Penny full partners in Dan's American life, even becoming American herself, she gifted Dan with cultural and familial riches of her English life, which included Penny's parents, her three sisters and brother and their families. The greatest connection for Dan was Penny's father, Roger. Dan and Roger were kindred spirits, birds of a feather, bees in a pod, Roger would greet Dad in his home in Nora Chamber with the robust, my dear boy, and they would sit for hours in conversation with their many shared passions, theology, music, theater, literature. There was never a more perfect union between father-in-law and son-in-law, and between husband and wife, between Dan and Penny. I heard Dan say many times that it was not possible to even begin to imagine life without Penny, that she completed him. He was proud of the intentionality of their relationship, of how hard they worked through challenges, how, with the help of the church and their faith, those challenges were not only met, they were the grist that deepened the bond of their marriage, the 46th anniversary of which they celebrated just 10 days before Dan's passing. It was this bond that saw Dan and Penny through challenges, a family she never have to endure, a child with cancer, the loss of their home to the ravages of the Oakland fire. 
Dan almost losing Penny when she was hit by a car. Dan said the light went out of his life with the thought he could lose her. His life made in love. And in these last three months, when Penny labored, literally 24-7, Dan knew that it was she who gave him the good death he so yearned for. With loving support from Stephanie, who flew in from Austin every few weeks to help, Penny eased Dan's burdens, physical and emotional, ensuring that all of his needs were met. He had neither wants nor worries. He had no pain. He had time, but not too much. He was fully conscious right up to the final days able to reflect on the fullness of his life, able to hear the soft whisperings of God gently pulling him into the fullness of his death. Dan did in dying what he did in living, entering into the depth of things, seeking knowledge, sharing truth, finding beauty, turning prose into poetry, theater into life, curriculum into inspiration, homilies into song, song into sacrament, all expressions of what Dan knew to be the sacredness of the created world, which he loved so much. Above all, Dan's family was at the center of his world, the sun around which his life orbited, held by a gravitational pull of love. How blessed we all are to be stars in that orbit, which Dad knew Dad could not touch. Priest. Priest. We 
People ask me, why do you want, why did you want to be a priest? And I said, I don't know. I just don't know anything else I want to do. It just seems like a, a good thing to do. I love people. I love helping them. The church would give me that opportunity. So what I chose the priesthood as Dan did, and I know somewhat of what chose, I think we had the same, same goal. A place to heal, to help, do something good. I'm so impressed about the life he led here. I didn't know him as much as I know now. I knew him when he was so young in this work, and he, he and I, as I said, met when I was a deacon, he was already a priest. We used to sit around and talk about our first experiences as priests and how difficult it was at the time that we became priests. And the reason it was difficult is because there had been this thing, this council, Vatican II, 62 to 65, both of us were in the seminary. And when those documents were finished, we were studying them. As soon as they were approved, we were studying them. And we heard exciting things about change. And there was something that touched both of us in all of that, but I don't know if we knew it then. I think we know it now. But there was a lot to do with that council, and much of it changed the things in the way we worship and the, the arrangement of a room. In fact, most people still think that's what Vatican did, Vatican Council II. It changed the way we worship. That was the tip of the iceberg. That was the easy part. But deep inside of it, there was something else. There was a call to each and every human being that we are supposed to be holy and can be holy because it's not something you do. It's something that happens to you. It's a gift. It's the fruit of the work, the struggle, the pain. I remember thinking about that, that I didn't have to go into some kind of monastery or something, or he didn't either. As we long for a spiritual life, we both struggle with the idea of how do we do it, how do we find it. Neither of us do it at the beginning. The other thing the council did is gave a tremendous amount of dignity and responsibility to every one of us to sit down and figure out what is truly the right thing to do. There's such an incredible, beautiful passage in those documents about the dignity and the value of a human being deciding with the help of God who lives inside them what to do. And that was the struggle for Dan and I. Because we came into a church that wasn't welcoming. It wasn't. Clergy, depending on their age, usually, were frightened by this because in a way it was such a radical change I can understand fully now why they were so resistant to the changes. There were people out there who loved it and there were people that hated it. We struggled to find our place in that. And along with that place that we were looking for in the church and how we were going to work in it, we saw the institution working with us and against us. And we used to ponder that all the time. Sitting around laying on the floor, drinking scotch, listening to Barbara Streisand, reading important stuff. No, seriously, it was, it was amazing. I feel like I knew him when he was beginning this incredible, fruitful life that he's lived here. What a privilege to be a part of him then. Now remember, back in 1969, Go back one year, 68, Dan brought me to California. He loved California, and he showed it to me, and he showed it to me in a way that I have. I came back for 20 years in a row. I loved him, because he gave me an image of it that was so rich and so full, and it was all around the Monterey Bay, and Carmel, and Big Sur, and the Pinfe, all these places. He showed them to me, he invited me into them. 
One of the things I love about our conversations as we struggle to figure out where we're going to place this thing we are, it showed me so many, gave me so many insights that I now <coughs> thank him deeply for, but they all were found in a way of reading a film, a book, your life. It's filled with images, it's filled with direction, it's filled with wisdom. And he struggled. And I struggled. Now, I'll never forget the day. It was, it was in July. It was in 1969. We were lying on the grass in front of Deering Valley in the square. On a beautiful afternoon. And we had noticed that there were, it was a theater there, and we went to see a play. And the play was, of all things, the Fantastic. <laughs> the longest running musical in the history of, of the United States. <laughs> it was opened in 1960, off Broadway, it was 1969, it was there. We went to that and we were mesmerized. Two young lovers, intoxicated with the beauty of their relationship, the newness of it. Two young priests, intoxicated with the newness of the church and what we wanted to do. And how are we going to do it? If you know the play, it's got learning. With all that enthusiasm and all that excitement and all that wonder comes the reality of pain and suffering, struggle. That wonderful line in that song, try to remember the time in September. Everything was wonderful. And they know that there was a there's a time deep in December when you find out the only way that you can change a heart from being hollow is with her. And it hurt a lot. A lot of his relationships were difficult. And you worked through it and you worked hard for it. He's, for me, more than I think I realize now, as I think about the fullness of who he is. But the thing I want to say right now is there's something so real, so powerful about people coming into our life at exactly the right time, exactly the right time. And to be open to that and to drink it in and feel it is, is the gift he was to me. Teach me that exactly. He was that, which is the best way to teach my kids. So thank you, Dan, for that. I don't know if I've been able to share with you people what you wanted me to share. But in all your wonderful, wonderful, good, generous, loving things that you did, they just didn't come naturally. They weren't that easy all the time. And for that pain that you went through, I thank you. Because I see the fruit of it in such a beautiful way tonight. And I know that Dan, because I believe this more now than I ever did in my life, is not somewhere else. He's here. Right now, here in this room. As real as you are, and I am here, he is here. And he is delighted. Delighted. And proud. Proud of his work. Thank you for his relationships. I want you to know it wasn't always easy. And there were times when I held him and he cried. And that wasn't just the beginning. But Dan, thank you for that. All that you've given.
when I walk between us, all of these old doubts return. Did I really do more harm than good? Did I betray you, Lord? Was I a defective priest? Was I really following the bent of my own temperament? But it was my temperament to seek you, Lord, with a passion that consumed me. Once I had felt the wound of love, there was no other way. You were with me in those lepers' shacks. You let me hear a festering mass of flesh still praise your name. The agonies I come to, the wounds I thirst, they were the agonies and wounds of Christ. You are my God.